All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's 635. I know a few people are still coming in, but I think we want to respect everyone for being here. Um, Kathy, if that's okay with you, we can at least start introductions. Perfect. So good evening, everyone. I'm going to quickly share my screen. And I think Kathy Shane, the chair of the school building committee, would just like to say a few words. You have to unmute Kathy. Uh, Brian, I believe you have to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Donna had control of- over Sorry. My, that's okay. <laughs> it's, it's my children would like a mute button like that. I was just gonna say, I never have that control, Kathy. <laughs> so I, I wanna welcome everyone. Um, I think as I saw people coming in, I think I know many of you, but I'm the chair of the school building, elementary school building uh, program. Uh, project and we have a fabulous committee and I am basically turning the whole meeting over to Donna Danisco and the Danisco team and she will introduce our team that are working with us um, as we enter this final lap of the beginning lap of the school. It's been a very exciting project. And um, I don't think with any further ado, um, I don't wanna say very much more, but I will say that the charts that you're going to see tonight, we will be posting right after the meeting. Um, and there will be some interactive and we really appreciate many of you who have sent us emails with your views, with your analysis, with your questions, we appreciate all the public participation, and I thank you. Donna, it's back to you. Thank you. So I just want to make sure I tried to move my window around. I don't, can everyone just thumbs up, can see the screen? No. All right, let me change it back then. Of course, I mucked it up. Um, bear with me for one second then. Okay. Is it everyone able to see my screen? Perfect. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Um, again, thank you, Kathy. My name is Donna Daniska with Daniska Design. Uh, with us this evening is Tim Cooper, who's a project manager with Daniska Design. And we have Margaret Wood with um, Answer, our owner's project manager. Uh, Rick Rice is actually on vacation, so good for him. And Vivian was unable to attend as well. But um, we first would just like to say thank you to the entire community for all of your participation, being in attendance in many, many, many of these meetings and your sharing of questions, which have really helped us understand what's most important to you all and how we can best facilitate and provide the information to you. So. This evening, what we just quickly like to do is we have a little bit more of an update for you. We have developed phasing diagrams, site phasing diagrams to show everyone how each option, renovation addition or new construction would work at both Fort River and Wildwood sites. And you'll see that they do slightly vary. And then we have received updated budget information, cost information. So we'll be sharing that with you. And then what's really important to note, and, and for us, this is a really huge and exciting milestone. I think it's a little nerve wracking to the community, but on Monday, um, the elementary school building committee will be selecting a preferred solution or the preferred option for us to bring before the MSBA to make a final decision um, and, and acceptance so that we can then actually start designing the school. So with that, um, oh, and then lastly is we actually have the evaluation criteria that the building committee will be analyzing and using to come to, come to that uh, preferred solution. And this evening, we're actually gonna ask you all to let us know what is important to you as we start looking at and ranking the criteria for, for the preferred solution. So with that, Tim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. Um, 
So uh, just a few general comments about the phasing diagrams we're gonna be looking at. Um, for both of the new construction options, uh, construction will start in August of 24, and the building will be complete in June of 26 with uh, the remainder of the site and demolition of the existing building happening in the fall of 26. And then with renovation and addition options, uh, start will be in August of 24, and work will happen in phases through spring of 27. Um, all of these diagrams are based on the building layout, parking requirements, um, outdoor play, and learning spaces as we understand them now. All of them will be refined as we design the building. So just those could um, all have an effect on these preliminary diagrams. So we're gonna start with a renovation addition option on the Fort River site. Um, so you can see here uh, what would be phase one starting in August of 2024. Um, and we'll look at early packages to get the contractor on site as soon as possible. But uh, the area on the south of the site that in the red line would be fenced off and be the exclusive area of the contractor for his work um, for demolition of the existing portion of the building containing the cafeteria administration suites in the kindergarten, um, installation of temporary facilities that would allow the building to continue to function, uh, a boiler and an electric room, which are in the part of the building that would be torn down in the initial phase, and installation of a geothermal well field uh, that would allow the building to function completely under its own power after the initial phase. Um, you'll notice that the contractor and school access to the sites are indicated and they would be separated. Also, contractor access to the site would be restricted during drop off and pickup times for a further layer of separation during the busiest times of the day. Um, and then school in the existing building north of the contractor area would function as it does now, there would probably be some accommodation that would have to be made. Lunches would probably be served in the classroom as it was done for COVID. And the play area adjacent to the building on the northern half of the site would be maintained for recess, including the hardscape play area north of the building. Parking and drop-off functions would be slightly modified from the existing um, operations. Currently, parents drop off south of the building and buses drop off on the west of the building, uh, both of those functions would happen along the parking lot on the west of the building during the construction phase. After the initial phase is complete uh, in January 26, the contractor would move to the northern portion of the site with the students occupying the newly completed addition on the southern part of the site. The Existing classroom wing would be, have some demolition in the center to get light into the building. The classrooms would all be completely rebuilt and the playground and athletic fields on the northern part of the site would be completed while the contractor has that area for their exclusive use. And during this time, the entire southern part of the site would be available for use for school activities. So Tim, I, I just want to interrupt, and, and I apologize if I wasn't clear in my introduction. Um, right now, what we're looking at is we have two, two sites to consider, which is actually, um, I know there's a little bit of anxiety about which site, but you actually have two sites, the Fort River and Wildwood site that um, is, is a um, decision needs to be made, as well as a renovation addition or a new school on either site. So it's almost like renovation, addition, or new construction. And then a second conversation is which site, Fort River or Wildwood. So I, I apologize for not being clear at the beginning. Sorry, Tim, go right sure. ahead. And, and this second phase of construction would be completed in the spring of 27. And then during the both phases of construction as available, um, the parking, would be used uh, for the school. And during summers, when there is no school parking, uh, the contractor could uh, reconfigure the parking into its final state so that it will serve the new building. 
And here's a look at uh, a completely done site plan uh, once the contractor is off the site in the spring of 27. So the other option on the table is a completely new building, which would be built adjacent to the existing and fully occupied school. Um, the contractor area for the first phase in this method is slightly smaller, uh, but is still ample to give the contractor all of the room that they would need to one, build the building and do all of the site work on the southern portion of the site. As with the renovation addition option, contractor and school traffic would be separated. There would be the same limitations at drop off and pick up to keep uh, any conflict between the different types of traffic to a minimum. Um, and then with this option, uh, there's a larger portion of the northern part of the site for play during construction. So here in June of 26, after the building is complete, the contractor would move to the northern portion of the site to complete that site work and demolish the existing building potentially before the start of school in the fall of 26. And that work would continue into the fall of 26. And as with the renovation addition option on Fort River, the parking would most likely be built in phases as available over the three summers of the project and finished in the fall of 26. Moving to the other potential site, uh, Wildwood, uh, we already have looked at both renovation addition and new construction options on the site, starting with renovation addition. Um, it's similar in that there will be two phases, but you can see that the Wildwood site is considerably smaller than Fort River. So the initial phase will take up at least half of the site. Um, the same process would happen in terms of demolition of the portion of the building with the administration suite, cafeteria, uh, and the kindergarten classrooms. The contractor would have the consulting part of the site to install the geothermal well shown to the southeast. And this would allow the building to be fully functional after phase one. Phase two, the contractor would continue work and renovate the classroom wing, uh, the access of school traffic and construction traffic would be flipped and there would be a temporary parking area to serve the school during phase two. Uh, due to the smaller site at Wildwood, there is not enough room uh, potentially to build all of the parking in its final condition during the two phases. So there might have to be a temporary parking area as shown here. Uh, so picking it up with the second phase of a renovation addition at Wildwood, um, you can see the contractor has moved to the northern part of the site. Uh, the geothermal field uh, is installed on the southern. I should have pointed out before that um, it exists under play space here now. Um, it can also exist under um, parking areas. Um, once it's installed, it's five to six feet below the surface and you'll never know it's there from uh, occupying the site. Um, should we go to the next slide, please? So because the um, Wildwood site is smaller, there is a third phase where an area will have to be granted uh, exclusive access to the contractor so that they can put um, the remainder of the parking into its uh, final disposition. Uh, so, you know, into the summer of 27, there will be an area with a renovation addition on Wildwood that will be um, closed off from school use, but a small portion of the site. And then if we go to the final configuration, uh, in its final state, there would be separate parking and drop off routes for both parking, uh, both bus traffic and parent drop off. Um, so that school with the larger enrollment would function similar to the way that it does today. So now going through uh, a new building on the Wildwood site, uh, what is currently the play area south of the site would be the site for the building. Um, it would be 
nestled into the hill a little bit with a retaining wall um, holding back the earth. Uh, the geothermal well field would be under the existing parent drop-off parking, uh, which would eventually become one of the parking areas for the school. And during this first phase, as with the other phases and the other options, um, contractor and school vehicle traffic would be separated from each other. The same limitations would apply to when contractors could go on and off the site. Um, I should mention that the fence between um, the existing building and the construction activities will be opaque and safe for the children on site. And then as we move to phase two of a new building on the Wildwood site, uh, the building would be complete in June of 26. And then during the summer before school is occupied in the fall, the building would be demolished uh, and the extent and northern portion of the site with play areas and playgrounds and parking would be finished into the fall of 26 and spring of 27. And then as with the renovation addition option, there would be a final stage where the drop-off loop and remainder of the parking is completed in summer of 27. And as the geothermal wells were placed under the playground in the reno add option, they are placed under the parking and drop-off loop here, both of which function equally well in terms of their performance in the building. Uh, I don't know if we want to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so um, why don't we pause here? And I apologize for the disruption. So if we want to go back to any of the slides. But with that, now would be a good time while the uh, construction phasing diagrams, we've just gone through them. If anyone has any questions or thoughts as it relates to the phase and construction phasing for either site and for either an addition renovation or new construction. Um, I apologize, I, it says ID, I, I don't recall your name, but go right ahead. Yes, hi, sorry, I was just renaming me. It's Irene. No, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question. It's a very unfortunately that in none of the blueprints of uh, Wildwood, the slope is marked on the side. Um, I'm wondering how does it affect, I don't know, I drive there quite often. Um, like it seems that the parking would be on the slope or is that wrong? Uh, so because the slope, I, because yeah. the slope is quite sharp. So the, the slope is dramatic on the northern portion of the site from- But even on the side of, by the driveway, nope. when we uh, drive in the school, there's a big drop off between the current driveway and the current parking lot. There is a big height difference there. So I, I wish that you had marked the profile mm -hmm. lines on the height. So then it's, it's easy to, to understand um, with respect to current situations, um, how does it affect? Nope, understood. Um, and, and you are correct. There is a slope on both the access drive and from Strong Street down on the green area and even to the east of the site from the path and where the building is shown. Um, and that is a consideration for the parking. In this configuration, the parking lot will slope up to the drive aisle and the play areas will be flat to a certain point, but then at the beginning of the shaded area, the grass will slope up to the road. Uh, but as laid out now, everything will be within, you know, accessible tolerances for the slope of drive lanes, the slope of sidewalks. Um, and as we get into the design, absolutely everything will be documented, but at this level, um, we, we do general checks to make sure that we can work with the slope, but you are correct. There will be regrading that has to happen to make all of this work on site. Um, and that is built into the project. Sarah, Marshall. Yeah, thank you. M maybe I missed it. Did you show the a new school at Fort River? Yes, let me yes. go back to that. 
Oh, I must have stepped no, out. That's I'm sorry. okay. Nope, not a problem. So uh, we did have a little bit of a disruption here. So um, what we have here is the phase one uh, would be to fence off the southern portion of the site where it says contractor par parking. The geothermal well field would be constructed. The hashed red line is the contractor area. And as Tim mentioned, um, for both sites, a lot of the same construction methods are going to occur at both sites, but the this is um, going to be a fenced area so that there will be a clear separation and safety for staff and students. The contractor would enter on the southern entrance of the site and the school um, occupants would also come in and out through the north and south entrances. So phase one would be developing, um, constructing the new school. Phase two, uh, as soon as the new school is open, the uh, school would move into it and we would then move the contractor area to the north of it. Again, just switch the fence line the contractor over the summer of um, June of 26 would demolish the existing building and then complete the extra um, playground areas and the athletic fields to the north of the site. And because we're actually maintaining a, a lot of the existing parking, uh, we're just going to as, as much as we can over summers during the construction so that it doesn't interfere with the use of the parking during the school year over um, the three summers and the fall to just complete the parking. And that would be right, right now from the schematic or concept level, this would be the completed site. Did you have any questions to that, Sarah, or? No, <clears throat> no, thank you. Okay. thank you. Must have been before the hiatus. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Well, it's good to, good to see the new ones back to back. So thank you. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any other comments? Pam, let me unmute you. There you go. You should be able to. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I, I wasn't able to show a raised hand, so I appreciate it. I really appreciate all the work that you've done to sort of lay out these options and you know compare apples to, to apples. Um, I I looked at just one thing that that was striking to me in this phasing, uh, which was very helpful, and that is that I'm I'm trying to compare the outdoor space for the children um, during the during the construction at either site. <clears throat> And I'm really just focusing on new construction because I, you know, anyway, um, I really like the fact that during phase one of, um, of Fort River, there is a decent amount of outdoor play space, including the ball field, right? As shown mm -hmm. with the cursor. Um, whereas the construction site, obviously, including the, the well field uh, is out of commission. And so that, that looks like it's for um, fall 24, uh, spring 25, summer tw fall 25, and spring 26. So that's roughly four semesters that the kids have outdoor play space. Um, at phase two of Fort River, where, yeah, we've already gone to that. Uh, I was looking that the outdoor play space uh, south of the building, probably the fields aren't available but the hard, the hard surface and the developed areas are, um, and maybe the geothermal well could get um, built and capped and seeded perhaps in year 2020, I don't know, for maybe, maybe 2025 and get a head start on growing grass. Um, if, I, if I look at 
Wildwood, if you're able to pull up Wildwood. Yeah, and and Pam, um, if I could, you picked up on that. I don't, I don't think that we adequately commented on the play fields. So thank you for pointing. I just, just for everyone's benefit, what Pam is referring to is when we um, complete the fields. There's a growing season that's required before you can actually use the fields. This is all with the assumption um, for now, as we're really honed in on the cost of this that that this is not sod that it's it's strictly grass and seeds so yes there's a whole nother growing season that the fields would not be thank you pam for pointing that out so in wildwood in phase one i actually don't see any outdoor play space for the children and that would be for roughly the same four semesters uh, of oh let's go to let's go to the new new construction sorry rather than oh sorry yes yeah yeah so during new construction even there there is no outdoor play space the the area to the north of the building is parking lot so I I that's for four semesters then if we go to phase two. Um, the area immediately around the building is predominantly, predominantly developed or hardscape um, areas and, and very little fields because there are no fields that's right up against the edge of that hill. So the, the play area, outdoor play space for fields doesn't happen for another um, three semesters uh, given, given the fact that you need to grow the grass again. Um, I, I don't know about the, the mental health the health of the children and I really and truly don't know about the mental health of the faculty having kids indoors for seven semesters, um, but I would feel very badly um, trying to deal with kids who do not have outdoor play space for seven semesters. Uh, that, that um... You are correct that there is very limited play area for the students during the entire construction period. The basketball um, hardscape area on either side of the gym, plus the area, the green area, you know, right, right after that would be available. There may be some opportunities. Hillside up there. Use use some of the area, Tim. I think we were saying that's approximately an acre of yeah, play. The area that includes the um, basketball courts to the east of the building and the and the portion of the green that is flat before you get to the hill, it's it's just about an acre, which is uh, you know the size of a, a decent playground, but it is not by any means the area that it would is available now so yeah and you'd probably have to put up fencing to keep them separated from the parking area so anyway yeah. i just wanted i i was struck by that as i looked through the phasing and i said hmm i think we should kind of you know confirm these numbers and understand what the children have to go through during construction at each of these two phase uh, two sites so thank you thanks for the yeah. good diagram um i think Rudy Perkins. Rudy, if you can hear us. Yeah, can you hear me now? Sure can. Perkins Amherst. Um, it looked to me from your phasing diagrams for Fort River that you will you would have fenced separation of the driveways or else separate entrances for the driveways for the contractor and the school parking. Am I reading that right? If you go to the new construction. Yeah. That phase one it is the fence line separating actually the uh, school egress and the contractor egress in that it would separate there would be a gate at the um area so, at the entrance. So, you, so on the fort river we'd have really separate from the street contractor and school egress whereas at wildwood it looks like a uh, contractor and the school are sharing the driveway along with the uh, uh, Head Start building uh, halfway down the driveway. Have I got that right? That yeah, is so, really yeah. separate. They're yeah, so separate at Wildwood. 
So just to um, stay Very. on Port River and then we'll jump. Um, yeah. Our, our thought and intent is to expand the entrance yep. and make this wider so that we could have three lanes of traffic. Right. So, so, yeah. No, yep. I like that. I'm not arguing with the yep. four. Just, just for clarification for everyone. And then if we go to pick, pick an, oh, let me, let me go to new construction. Yeah. Um, here, there would be one way in out for the contractor and one way in out for the use of the school. At, at the parking area, but not down the length of the driveway from the street. Correct. So what we commonly do, Rudy, is we restrict the contractor from driving during drop-off and pickup so that they, they do not interfere with um, drop-off and pickup, right? So we'll say, okay, you can get on the site, but no vehicles from 745 to 845 so that there's there's no interference with drop off and pick up and and then on drop off and on the pickup side we would enforce the same yeah i appreciate that that's a good idea i just think that physical separation is is better at fort river than than the wildwood plan just cuz you don't have the room to do it with only one entrance and a you know but anyway so yeah agree that's a a very good observation Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And does anyone else have, Rudy, I think your hand's just still left over. Um, <laughs> does anyone else have any other comments, questions? And all of this is, we want to say preliminary. Um, you know, we have not selected a construction method, whether it be design, bid, build, or CM. However, in either construction delivery method, I should say, our goal would be to have an early site enabling package so that we could get ahead and prep the site over the summer. You can see we anticipate the drawings and the bidding to be completed and construction start August of 24, but to take advantage of the month of July, let's just say, we, we will probably have a site enabling package, a totally separate package that would allow us to at least start to prep the contractor area, put up the fence so that in September when the students come back or end of August, that, that that separation is clear and um, obvious to everyone. And Amber, one second. Go ahead, Amber. Hi, um, yeah, thank you um, so much for your presentations and all the hard work. Um, I just have a question about, um, I know you're presenting four different options um, and are there like significant cost differences between the reno um, versus the new and I mean, I guess like what are some of the as well like um, ecological impacts? I guess of you know uh, demolishing everything and starting new. Is how significant is that? Or you know, can you just explain those factors a little bit? Uh, sure, we'll we'll be jumping into the cost in a second, right? Um, so you're getting ahead of us, but that's okay. Um, ecologically, um, Tim, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I um, I mean, to describe the options in terms of embodied carbon, there is probably a higher cost in terms of new construction. That's just a fact. Um, ecologically, if you're talking about the impact on stormwater management, uh, native habitat, stuff like that, um, all of those things would be considered in the design of both options and preserve and maintain to the extent possible. Um, and then there's also the consideration of carbon use going forward as the building is heated and cooled over its lifetime. Um, and from that respect, uh, a new building performs a little bit better. So it, it depends on your particular lens of how you're viewing the building's interaction with the environment. And I think just to add to that, um, you can see that the building footprint is probably about half, maybe a little bit more than half 
of the existing current footprint. Um, and then the way that we propose addressing the stormwater on the sites really provides wonderful opportunities for learning. These will be um, swales will be collecting the water. I I'm not sure if you were um, attended the last presentation, but these would be small or shallow swales that with all natural habitat and, and um, you know, local plants, et cetera, so, so that it actually would enhance the site as, as we develop that that actually would be whether it was a renovation addition or new construction. But um, I, I just want to point out that any option that there will be um, improvements to either site. Thank you. All right. So Amber's excited to hear about the money. So <laughs> does anyone else have any other questions? I don't see any. So, it, and, and if anyone thinks of anything, we're always happy to, to come back to this. So Margaret, do you want to start this off? There you go. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Margaret Wood. I'm the owner's project manager. And I am just going to say a little bit about the process. Um, the way the MSBA requires us to document the cost of the project at this level and at at the next couple of levels through the process to, is to actually get two estimates. So what happens is Danisco Design has an estimating partner and we have an estimating partner and they basically estimate um, separately and then uh, we meet and uh, sort of do what's called a reconciliation looking at the uh, costs line by line. So for the purposes of what Donna and Tim are gonna show you tonight, we're looking at the estimate that was developed by their estimator, who's considered the estimator of record. But um, I just wanna reassure everyone that it, these numbers have been checked against another estimator who is, both of these estimators who are involved are very experienced with school building projects in Massachusetts. And the numbers actually came out very, very close. So for consistency's sake, um, these uh, estimates are by A.M. Fogarty. And I think with that intro, I'm gonna turn it back. Um, the only um, other comment I would make is that um, as, as Donna and Tim will show you, there's you know several different levels. There's the subcontractor cost, there's the general contractor cost, there are soft costs associated, and then um, they sort of all get rolled up in the project, but uh, the Danisco slides uh, go into a fair level of detail. So um, I'm gonna let Donna and Tim walk you through it. Great, thank you. So um, we are currently at the study phase. So I, I think first what we would like to say is we have spent a lot of time on the site actually recognizing the challenges and the site attributes at both sites. So we've taken a really deep dive on, on the costs of the site work. But because we haven't actually started drawing anything and, and have defined a lot, um, this preferred schematic or study cost estimates really are to help guide you to evaluate the alternatives from a cost perspective, right? So it's preliminary design pricing. Um, it does include all of the town requirements. We'll go quickly go through that. And then of course the general site work. And what this will do is, and we are confident both cost estimators do a lot of public MSBA K through 12 work, um, as does Danisco and Answer. So we're very familiar what the costs are for this type of work. We, we spent some time walking through the basis of design, which is identifying standard um, 
materials and fixtures and and the envelope of the building with certain parameters with the building committee. So we feel good for not having anything necessarily drawn what these prices are. So what we've done is we've developed actually three different options for both sites. We have an addition renovation option. We have a three-story new school construction option and a two-story new construction option, both on Fort River and Wildwood site. The new schools um, will not exceed 105,750. That, that is the prescribed method with MSBA. We have the educational program, and then there's a 1.5 multiplier to that. So that's our, our committed square footage number that we would not exceed. The addition renovation is a little less efficient, so it's slightly more. So these prices that are before you right now are using a CM at risk delivery construction method, delivery method. We have um, actually split out what an addition would cost and what it costs to renovate the building. Then we have uh, for the new schools, the cost of the new school construction. We have demolition broken out. And then we have hazardous materials um, and abatement work that is also broken out per site. We've also broken out the site work per, per phase and or per option or concept and site. And you'll see that the numbers range anywhere from 6.9 to 11.7. We've included the PVs or um, photovoltaics, as you can see, for each option. And in the past, we were showing those a little before the subcontractor costs, after the subcontractor costs, but we've rolled in, as we've heard that it was confusing before, we've actually rolled those into the subcontractor or direct cost of work. And we have spent quite a bit of time evaluating this with an EUI target of 25 and um, also utilizing the ground source heat pumps. We know what the roof area is that would be available for PVs and then what the PV canopies would be on the site. So the amounts actually do differ a little bit. Um, they go down with a two story because we have more roof area. And then we have the new, the three, the three story actually um, is a little bit more because we don't have as much roof, the building's more compact. So we, we need to provide more uh, PVs for the canopies. And then for the ground source heat, we'll be using a geothermal well field. And these are direct correlation to the needs of a building as far as the shape, the geometry, and the efficiency of each option. So you have a subcontractor cost running um, below, and this is the what we call the direct cost of the work. And then the contractor has markups, which um, at this point also include design contingency, escalation, and a bunch of other, um, they have general conditions and um, their profit. And so you'll see that those numbers are reflective and it's typically a percentage of the direct costs. So then what you have is your, pretty much your total construction cost running along here. And we understand that there's a commitment, a percent for arts for $250,000. So we are continuing um, to include that in the costs. So if we look at the least expensive to the most expensive wild wood site for an addition renovation is approximately uh, 8.5 million. It goes up to 80, 8.5, wouldn't that be nice? 81.5 million. A uh, new three-story building is 82.9 million. And a new school is a new two-story school is slightly more at 83.7 million. At Fort River, um, you'll see that 
the driver because the building costs are all pretty much the same. What we have is the site costs are more. There's a more site area and what we need to do to um, address the high water table is that the low cost is 84.7 million for a new three story to 86 million for a two story and then 86.8 million for our ad reno. Then we add in what we call the soft costs or, or the, um, you know, the, the soft costs, which there's a multiplier right now at this point, it's a typical multiplier of 1.25 <laughs> of the construction costs. These include fees, town agency reviews, has hazardous material, abatement oversight. A lot of the cost is in furniture and equipment and the instructional technology. It includes contingencies and construction testing and oversight. And so when you add it all together, your range for total project cost at this point, starting with the lowest of at Wildwood for an addition renovation of 101 million, $102 million um, incrementally, slight, slight increments going up for a three-story and a two-story um, new construction is actually a little bit more than a three-story. And then over at Fort River, the least expensive option is actually a three-story new school at 105 million. Two stories a little bit more. And then an addition renovation is the most expensive. We started looking at opportunities to reduce the overall construction costs. And there are two methods that were allowed for public construction, chapter 149. Our options are traditional 149 design bid build. That's where we actually put together all of our construction documents, put it out to bid. Contractors will bid on it based on price. And that, that's it, that, that's how that works. If we do the CM at risk, there's some added expenses and then there's some added benefits. Collectively, our project team with ANSWER believe that the design bid build for new construction is absolutely worth consideration for this project. We understand both sites are tight. Um, we have done this for other school projects that have very similar attributes, site attributes. So we're confident that we could deliver the project in a safe manner for your staff and students utilizing a design bid build construction. And what you'll see is there's a savings of approximately 8% as it relates to new construction. So if we do move forward with a new school versus a renovation addition, and we do utilize the design bid build construction delivery method, the prices for your total project range from $95.3 million for a new three-story building at Wildwood to $98.9 million at the Fort River School site for a new two-story school. It's, it, I, it's a lot to take in. So I think we'll just pause and I've got Margaret standing by to help facilitate if I, if I spoke architectural speak and 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 you need some clarifications if anyone has any questions Doug um, go ahead Doug yeah I just wondered what uh, escalation rate you're assuming to midpoint of construction uh you got me off guard. I yeah. So it's it's, it's um we this is one of the things we actually discussed with the estimators together during the reconciliation, and I believe it's eight and a half percent. So typically collectively, we, yeah, collectively, what you do is it's it's on an annual basis, and it is projected through the midpoint of construction when the assumption is that everything has been bought at bought out by the contractor, but that is what's being carried here. And, and I think I would just like to add that 
the direct cost before the escalation is added in, which is actually part of the soft costs, um, is that the direct costs are actually also already inflated. So there's a, um, to where we think it currently is, right? So even though we don't have actuals right now. So is that, if that helps? Did I just confuse things, Margaret? Well, his hand went down, so I'm okay. guessing. <laughs> I'm hoping that that means that we got the got the answers. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Yeah, you know, if if our estimators could tell us if if they could predict where this market's going, they wouldn't be sitting in their office doing this work as much as everyone else right now. But um, we're all pretty much in the market and see what's occurring as much as the costs have increased even from three months ago and, and, and they have increased from three months ago, we would say that Amherst is fortunate not, not to be out there trying to construct this building right now. Um, it's, it's just not cost right now that's creating yeah. all, all of the issues. Yeah, I just I just want to also add um, that built into this these numbers are um, design and construction contingencies, as well as as real construction contingencies that are for things that can occur during construction. So I think a very reasonable concern for people looking at these is like you know oh my goodness, is is this number real? Um, I would say the number, as, as Donna just said, is a little bit inflated because the estimators are very uh, leery for good reason of what's happened in the market in the last two day, last uh, year and a half. But I think at this level, what we want people to be looking at is the relative, the relative cost because the same approach to the estimate has been taken with every option. So. Um, it, as we move forward into the next phase of developing the preferred option that the building committee will select, we will really have an opportunity to spell out in more detail what contingencies and buffers are built into these numbers to protect the town. Okay, so Doug's hand has gone up again, so. <laughs> Go ahead, Doug. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, is, it, is it fair to say based on your previous slide with the line items that uh, the primary difference between the sites is the size of the site and the site cost and the yeah. uh, provisions that you need to make to accommodate the various site conditions at Fort River, which seem not only larger, but you've got the, the high water table. Uh, otherwise, the two sites are quite similar. Um, so, you know, whereas uh, Ms. Rooney had pointed out the lesser playing fields uh, at Wildwood during construction, uh, the larger site at Fort River that gives you the play fields during construction comes at a higher cost because there's just more site to deal with. Yeah, and I would say it's also to me, it's there's, a, there's additional space, outdoor space that is um, included in that project. So the scope um, is, is different in the sense that the, you know, the sheer area of outdoor space that will be, that is built into the Fort River site is bigger and there is a price tag that reflects that. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I guess you. I did want to ask one more, or just as a follow-up to sure. the comment about the plate fields. Um, have, have you, are you allowed to think about some of the play fields that are to the south of the Wildwood site that you may be count or considering to be exclusively the middle school fields uh, as you develop your scenarios for, you know, interim play fields during construction? Yeah, absolutely. And we, we didn't want to factor that in right now because um, the town doesn't own that field, right? Don't, don't own the fields, it belongs to the regional middle school. If 
Um, while what is selected, uh, we will continue to or begin to have those conversations with the regional middle school to understand what we can be used there, what we can use those fields for. We had preliminary conversations that they said the field directly, let me just go to that slide. Um, Oh, now this, this, I don't know if this keeps showing up, but the fields to the, to the west of the tennis courts are not used for the middle school academic um, or PE. So they were saying those are fine. Um, we could maybe work with them, but that's the middle school talking. So we have to, and, and I believe the regional uh, school committee has also been receptive to starting to have those conversations. I do want to point out with that added field space comes added cost though. So in order to access those fields, it's about a 15 foot drop. So what we would need to do is provide an accessible route and path down to those fields. So there would be, um, I don't significant. I mean, we're, it, there would be added cost to making those that field available, and it's also our understanding that that field and that whole area is wet. So we would want to improve that area if it's going to be used for the students at the Wildwood site. So, yes, more fields, but again, almost going back to exactly what Margaret was saying, more site just adds more cost. Thank you. Thank you. Irene? Yes, thank you. So um, I wanted to ask a question. Actually, um, if you look at the table, if you take out the site cost, the Wildwood is higher cost because you have higher hazmat cost, right? The construction. So if you were comparing same, I was in the feasibility study for Fall River. Um, so when we did that, we had a much smaller scope and we only looked at, I think around the school, we didn't include improving all the fields. So the side cost was in part to what had been for Wildwood or less. Um, so I think it has to be clear that when we are comparing building part, it seems that Wildwood will be higher. The fact that you're having a twice bigger site um, that increases the cost, but the town is getting, I don't know, 14 acres of improved sites that hundreds of kids, I don't know, all the kids in town, I guess, use them for soccer and ultimate mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. throughout. So I think we have to be careful when we look at the numbers because yes, we get maybe a 2% increase, but at the same time, we're improving the life of all the kids that not only go to the school, but they use the fields. Uh, I was yesterday in Fort River and there was a play of the middle school and high school playing ultimate over there. So everybody would get improved fields to use throughout the whole year. Um, I think we have to be careful. The previous uh, person was mentioning, oh, what would is cheaper, but actually the construction cost because of hazmat is higher. Um, so if you were comparing apples to apples and sites comparison, um, I think I would, put it as a for river plus site plus fields and then wildwood. So I think we have to be careful when we do distinction. That's my yeah. Yes, and, and I um that that is ex exactly the point, I think, right, Irene, that there's just more site there. Um, there had been conversation about maybe we don't need to to improve the entire Fort River site. However, as you could see from the diagrams um, of the phasing that the contractor is gonna be disrupting like pretty much the whole site. So at that point, we really need to replace it at, at minimum in kind, but raising it by a foot and providing the proper drainage is, is worth doing as opposed to just putting it back to the way it is. Yeah. Okay. So um, with that, I, I don't know if anyone has any other questions. Um, what we'd like to say is um, bringing us forward that what 
now um, we're actually coming to a pretty critical time in the project where the building committee, school building committee on uh, Monday will be making a decision on what the preferred solution is. If it's a renovation addition or new construction, and is it gonna be on Fort River or is it gonna be on Wildwood? So there's really like four, four um, decisions that will need to be made. Um, with that, we do want to first say that when we look at the evaluation criteria, that here's the chart um, to the right of the screen that's been developed and, and it's quite detailed and it's been extremely well thought out, that all design options are going to achieve your net zero energy bylaw. Of course, it's going to meet building codes, including safe entrance and accessibility. And most importantly, it's going to meet the educational program. We developed the categories um, in for, for different um, categories, I guess I should say, that include equity and transition, educational building, site, construction impacts, and communities. But then, but then in having many conversations, um, it was clear that not every single criteria has the same value or weight when you're looking at which option makes the most sense. So we did do a, uh, the committee uh, develop what, what are the higher priority and have the higher weighting um, as it relates to every one of the criteria. So not, I'm not, these aren't in any particular order. Total cost, what, which option minimizes construction duration, and minimizes the impact on students, what the educational benefits of uh, the location adjacency, optimizes energy efficiency, maximizes efficient use of the site, outdoor play space, and then flexibility for future enrollment. So what we would like you to do is for you all to weigh in as well. And we would like to know what is important to you, and we'd like you to weigh in on these criteria. So I, if, for those of you who have been with us before um, and those that are new, just a reminder, if you could go to menti.com and enter the code up here or use your phone to screenshot on, on the screen, you'll go ahead and you can use the QR code. So we'll give everyone a few minutes to jump in. And I'm not, there we go. So what we've done is um, we've identified six items that we really feel that are the most important to the community or this with the building committee. These, these are their highest ranking priorities. And what we'd like you to do once you go to the menti.com and put in your codes is to rank from one to the, as the lowest priority in your opinion and six, what is this highest priority in your opinion? And what we're asking is just to use one number only once. So don't put in all sixes. <laughs> we, we, we know they're all really important, but we want to know what your highest priorities are. So we'll give everyone a few minutes to go ahead and rank their priorities. I see a couple of hands are raised. Irene? Yes, can you clarify what maximizes, maximizes efficient use of the site? Is it because maximizing maybe you put a larger building and finish the whole building. Um, what do you mean with that? Yeah, um, Margaret, I don't know if you want to jump in. This, oh, this people are already starting to jump in here. Um, this would be, you know, really making the best use of the site, right? Um, having, having the most open space or the most, as it relates to either option, right? As opposed to all parking, the existing building utilizes more space. Margaret, I don't know if you want to chime in. Yeah, Irina, you're exactly right. It, it's, it's really, um, 
perhaps a sort of uh, the subtext is if you have a build smaller building footprint, you're going to have more outdoor space. So perhaps we should have stated it more simply. But you're exactly right. right. So what you'll see here is this will actually, if I hover over these, it's kind of a neat tool will show us who's voting what. And, and we understand this is an extremely small sampling, um, but it's interesting to see where people's priorities are. So minimizes construction duration. You know, that's, uh, we've got some ones, twos, threes, fours, zero at five, one at six. Oh, it's coming along. I'm, we'll, we'll give everyone some time. <laughs> the, the more importantly, what it's looking like is the construction impact on students is more important than the duration of the construction. You can see that we have people voting six, five, four, couple in the twos. And then optimizes um, energy, which we understand is critically important to the community. And then maximizes the efficient use on site. It's actually a little bit over. We have uh, five. They're saying that's the their least pri the least priority out of the six, as as you look at ranking it, one being the low and six being the high. And then the outdoor space for play and education that actually is receiving the highest number of uh, first priorities right now. So I, I can't tell how many people I could add them all up, but I, I'm not. But <laughs> I, I think it, it, things are shifting a little bit. So maybe we'll just wait a couple of more minutes. I think the number of people might be 15 that have voted. I'm not sure if that's accurate. And this will, uh, we're recording the session. Um, I think we'll take out the area that we've been, we were quiet um, and then pull it all together. And we'll be posting this. And and again, you know, we understand this is a very small sampling of the town and uh, everyone's priorities, but it's just a, a kind of a good visual for the building committee to weigh in on. And I think some people were asking if there was another method to provide input and comments and um, there is. So we'll share that with you as well if, if you're uncomfortable or would prefer to put something in writing. Okay, we have 18 people weighing in. And Donna, I had um, saw 22 people in the audience, so I think we're pretty close. Perfect. Oh, we spoke too soon. All right, so 19 people have weighed in. So this is really helpful. And, you know, again, small sampling, but I, I, it will show you that people's priorities kind of just really, really range. So upcoming um, meetings and activities tonight, June 9th, uh, we have the community forum on Monday, June 13th, the building committee will be meeting and a perf the, the preferred alternative um, solution will be selected. Uh, we will, with that information, we will then, um, need a couple of weeks to put together the preferred schematic report that we'll be submitting to MSBA. 
And then we'll be bringing it back to the building committee on June 24th for them to vote on the entire preferred schematic report to submit to MSBA. That is due to MSBA on the 27th of June. And then MSBA, assuming they approve it, um, they will be voting on August 31st. So Donna, can I talk about the next Absolutely. steps after that? So um, the this stage, so there are three big stages of the feasibility process that we're in. The PDP, which preferred uh, preliminary design uh, program, which went in in March. Um, this document, which is going in in June. Um, what happens next is, I think going to be really exciting for everyone. This decision on an option has been a bit of a nail biter. And I you know, want to reiterate, as I said before, that I think Amherst is very lucky to have two sites to choose from and multiple options. Um, but it it's definitely, um, you know, caught, can cause, cause some anxiety, I think, for some folks. But I think um, we're very close to a decision. So the next step is going to be developing the design of the preferred option to what's called the schematic design level, which is, is still a fairly early level in the overall design process. But the goal is to develop the design sufficiently to really get a detailed cost that can be depended on for the purposes of the local vote. So I think as many of you may know, there's going to be um, a debt exclusion vote on this project. And that debt exclusion vote will happen in the spring. We don't have a confirmed date, but I'm guessing it will be March or early April. So the designers will have um, from the time of the submittal um, to roughly December to develop the design to develop the estimates related to that, to um, have, we'll have a number of additional community meetings, and then that will allow us to sort of bring it to the voters for their decision. And as the slide shows, then um, once that uh, vote occurs, assuming that it is in support of the project, there is a, a more detailed design process that produces the construction documents, which are the basis of bidding the project, and then construction. So we, we anticipate if the voters do approve the project in the early spring, that the building will be under construction starting the summer of 2024 and completed um, in the fall, in the summer or fall of 2026 or early 2027, depending on the option that is selected. And, and just to add to that, um, we had to make certain assumptions for the study and the preferred schematic report, such as what type of mechanical system, or is it gonna be air source um, heat pumps versus ground source heat pumps, right? So that conversation about how, what source uh, of, uh, I'm gonna say electricity, I know that's wrong, but, is it going to be ground source or air source will be used in the in the building that will will be spending a lot of time going through that with during schematic design as well as what is the building really going to look like you are looking at line diagrams right so we will have three dimensional fly throughs so after we we will spend time picking materials and colors and the shape of the actual building, of course, being mindful of how it all interacts with the educational program and maintaining the best spatial relationships and adjacencies. But all of this will come together during schematic design, which will also help us hone in and refine a budget. I will have it, we'll actually have a design that can be um, costed and um, it, it will just be a more solid cost estimate. Uh, Doug. Um, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, um, I'm, I just realized that the criteria you had us vote on this evening 
were all criteria that are applied within the boundary of the site. Um, you did not ask us to vote or on any of the site criteria in terms of their geographic location in town and uh, the transportation distances, that kind of thing. Um, and I wondered whether the criteria that the uh, committee will be using to select will include geographic considerations that are you know, outside of the boundary of the site. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, actually, um, those are also criteria. Oh, Kathy, you want to go right ahead? Thank you. Kathy, if you'd like to speak. Hi, Doug. I'm chair of the committee. Um, we will make sure anyone who's on sees that full criteria matrix. Those are indeed criteria. Um, one of the things we've discovered between the two sites is some don't vary very much. Um, so we looked at walkability, how many people can walk and live close enough to at least in theory walk as well as how many do walk. We've been looking at bus routes if you needed to take, take um, a public bus if you didn't have a car. So we are looking at um, what is near what um, as well as what is on the site, what traffic is near the entrance and exits of the building. So we just, uh, what was picked out here is a few things vary quite a bit by our options. So it's easier to differentiate options if there's a difference. If you say they're all pretty similar, it, it doesn't, it's not that much of a tool, but those are all criteria and we will be, we have started to score them and compare them. So it, this is just a handful. Um, and we didn't actually try to rank, rank them one through six. We just said some things appeared to be more important than the 40 things we're measuring. <laughs> um, so it wasn't, a, this is the most important. So thank you for the question because we did try to put as robust a set as we could that's important to the parents, to the students, to the teachers, to the staff, to the town. Um, Tracy. Hi, um, so I have a somewhat um, related question. Um, and I mean, it, I, you know, I, I think it's an important point that Doug was bringing up and I've been thinking about the transportation factors, you know, related to the two sites, um, just because I'm a transportation person. Um, and I didn't know whether it's really outside of the scope of this meeting a little bit of this as a forum. And um, I haven't been able to stay for the public comment at some of the meetings. Um, but I did, was looking at the 400 plus page for traffic analysis report that was came out a few weeks ago. And um, it seems to me, you know, as Kathy was saying that there, I mean, there are a lot of factors on the two sites and that the transportation one is probably not gonna be the major factor but just from a town perspective one thing i've heard you know some of the town officials say is just talk about you know the outside of this project just the different intersections near the two school sites and what upgrades might be needed at those intersections both to make them safer and to help with traffic issues and so on um and as i was looking through the report i did have questions about the traffic analysis that was done in the projections um, and maybe I, I mean, there are a lot of details, especially in the appendix, but one question I had is just, you know, as the people, no matter what the site is, like as the people who currently, for example, like live in North Amherst, and if the Fort River site is chosen, if they, you know, they have to go to Fort River, or, I mean, and if, and for the people in Amherst Woods and so on, if Wildwood is chosen, then they have to get from Amherst Woods or way East Amherst over to Wildwood. Um, it seems when I was looking at the analysis um, that in terms of the assumptions about how cars would make those trips is that some of the, and I'm looking at the intersections that were studied in detail, um, that one, one thing it didn't seem like it was considered that much would be the possibility that people making those trips either from the North Amherst to Fort River or from Amherst Woods and East Amherst to Wildwood that 
it's possible that quite a few people could travel along, say, Northeast Street and then Strong Street to make that connection. And if you look at the Google directions, a lot of times that would be the fastest route, just because particularly along some sections of Route 9 and Main Street that they just get so congested during the day, you know, even without construction. Um, and so I was just curious, you know, the extent to which those had been explored. It didn't seem like that was such a big part of the model. Thanks. Um, so Tracy, I am not sure if I'm going to be answering you um, specifically, but there, and, and obviously, if you read all 400 pages, you're definitely a transportation person. But um, and, and we appreciate that, right? So, and that's why that's why it's out there. But um, based on the way um, the current routes are and where we were identifying where the students would be coming based on the current maps, it, it's a little difficult to say where actual. Um, the families will be coming in four years in 2027. But um, I think the committee has recognized that there are, when we say transportation, we're, we're just talking about traffic as opposed to public transportation, because we've also looked at the public transportation, right? So it's a little bit different, but um, that, that we recognize that there will be an impact on transportation and as an aside to this or in conjunction with this we've started looking at ways that um, off-site traffic could be improved as but the challenge is right now and it has not yet been defined is you know right now we're focusing on the cost of the project as it relates to the the site but we've actually gone as far as looking at how we can improve either the East Pleasant and Strong Street intersection area, as well as the um, East Main and, and the Main Street. So we, we have really actually studied that. And um, we could, that, as you probably know, that's like a whole nother project in and of itself, but, but we're, we're aware of that. And we actually have some preliminary costs just to have a kind of ballpark. Is that, sorry, I mean, I'll mute you. You're okay, is that? Uh, I mean, yeah, I understand that. And again, like I know it's not the major factor right now. It was just, I mean, just hearing town officials talk about, well, you know, particularly if some of the intersection conditions get worse, like that those would be added costs. So just trying to just it, think it, about that a little bit, but. It, well, to say it's not a, a big consideration, I think we spent, a good two meetings just talking about traffic. So so it it is recognized. Kathy, I, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, but and it's 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 on the radar screen, Tracy. Um, you're absolutely correct. And I hope you stay involved of the town saying a few of these intersections we need to fix anyway, you know, even if we weren't talking about the school uh, there uh, and uh the town recently has been amazingly adept at getting grants that fit particular areas. So I think as we focus on a, the decision, we can hone in on exactly what, what we need to do sooner rather than later. And we just, we, we have the sketchiest kind of estimates on this, but uh, DPW and others are starting to look at it. So it's, a, it's the beginning rather than uh, even a, a best guess estimate at this point. Thank you. Um, Rudy? Oh, um, thanks. Uh, I had a question on whether the second versus third story question, three story versus two story, can be postponed until the schematic design when, when it's possible to see sort of what those could be in a little more detail, or whether that's sort of a necessary part of the upcoming PSR submission, because um, I personally, I'm at the point where, you know, the site seems obvious to me, it should be Fort River. The I've, I've decided we really need to do new construction because the embodied carbon 
argument is kind of outweighed by the complexities of our energy, water, groundwater management, and educational uh, requirements. Um, and we wouldn't, we'd be demolishing so much of the old building in the, in the ad reno anyway that I, I just don't think you get enough for your embodied carbon worries. Um, but the second versus third story, there's a lot of pluses and minuses on both. And I'm wondering, does that have to be decided now or can we wait? Thanks. Catherine. Um, you know, I just want to say, you know, what one of um, you could take down this priorities thing, Donna, is we want it to fit with the education program. And there was a strong consensus of the way the three story fit where which things were near each other. And I think we want to be guided by that so that we can start out the schematic design with um, and this three story was um, had lots of really strong benefits to it. So I don't think we want to delay that decision. At least the plan right now is to make that decision. And I understood that MSBA would also like us to come in and say, this is what we're planning on doing. So Donna and, and Margaret might want to come in. Uh, so I, I think we, we actually did a lot of vetting of possible layouts, but the particularly the way we can distribute special needs programs that they don't get isolated. Um, there was a fifth grade, fourth grade co-op uh, cohort that works really well in a, th a fifth grade. So there was a lot of time spent with thinking about what is near to what within the building. And I don't think we want to uh, slow that process down. That's my opinion. Um, Margaret, yeah, go ahead. So it's not, really, unfortunately, it, it's not an option. Um, the MSBA, the, the requirement of the submission that we are getting ready to make is to bring a single option to the MSBA. And I see Donna nodding. So um, I, I hear you, but I think um, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a choice that we can make here. Yeah, I think just, just to add to that and what Kathy said, if there was a clear argument um, or persuasion that they, they both really need to be studied and explored in more detail, et cetera, um, we would probably obviously need more time during schematic design because that would be pretty much having to develop two sites or two site options, not Fort River Wildwood, but we would have to be developing a site both for a new construction of a two-story, new construction of a three-story, um, as well as bringing the project along. So we would actually probably need more time. But um, in, in this case, from what we've heard that there's a, from the school department um, is that there really were some benefits to a three-story over a two-story as well. Thanks, Rudy. Um, so I, I just, I, I am happy to take down the screen. I just wanted to point out, I know some people were asking that if, if they could put their questions or comments in writing, um, I, I think I probably received five to 10 emails a day from Kathy with questions um, that, that people raise. So um, Kathy, is this the best place to submit questions and comments? And if you get them to us, we should hopefully be able to read them or have them before the vote on Monday. Um, yeah, you can do it through this website. There is a, a link. You can also email me directly, and it's my last name, then the letter C at amersmat, amersma.gov. And uh, I am doing scribe work for the whole committee, um, and I will make sure it goes to the whole committee if it's just a comment. If it is a an additional question or wanting clarification, I um, get them through to the design team, and I'm happy to do that. You know, we've been trying to collect them because uh, Amherst is a fantastic community. Many of you have similar questions, so we try to group them so it's not a um, 
uh, lots of nuances, but we've been putting them in the minutes as well as questions have been answered along the way. So we're trying to keep a record of what's been asked and answered. So it's possible some of the questions you might have, we've already covered. Or we might not be able to answer just yet. Yeah. Right, right. Um, so when you email through the website, that email is coming to my office and um, then I am forwarding it on to Kathy and if appropriate, it's going on to the building committee. Just see, so you don't feel like you're emailing into the void. So we would love any additional comments um, as it relates to the vote that will be taken on Monday. Monday morning. It's, it's anxious because it's, it's um, you have options and not every community actually has options. A lot of communities are like, how are we gonna get this to work? You have two viable options. So uh, um, the anxiety of having to pick one is, is hard. We understand that, but we, we'd love to have your comments. And our goal, um, we're, we're really excited about the next step that we're really gonna start to design a school that will em embrace your community. And we look forward to more input during schematic design. And I think that's all we had. So I will stop sharing. Um, does anyone have any general comments? Um, would like to weigh in on anything? before it's 8.30. We're actually a little early today. We sincerely appreciate everyone taking the time. Um, again, I know we're talking to the people that have watched this, but for those maybe you could share that this will also be, um, the, it's being recorded and we'll post it as well. The presentation will also be posted as well, uh, written comments are um, welcome. And I'm seeing people already saying good night. So with that, Kathy. Yeah, so I just wanna give a personal thanks to everyone who showed up and there are some people and you know who you are who have been with us, I would say every minute of the way, it's not just every step of the way. and. And it's, it's been terrific because um, one of the hopes of what feels like a speedway race to me, I've never built a school before, but I think many of us have never built a school before. Um, it's an extremely exciting project. And um, w in addition to everything else, this building being all electric and using renewable will be an education project for our kids. They're gonna be able to learn from the building um, so I, I see it as we have a, a generation coming up of young kids who will be able to say, how much energy did the sun generate for me today? How does this work? What's the outdoors looking like? And um, some of the films of schools that have been built this way talk about the excitement in the community among the kids and among the family of something that feels very real. So to me, the school feels very real. So I want to just thank everyone for your participation very much. And I think we, we can adjourn, Donna. Yeah, sounds good. One last call. Okay, again, please feel, oh, Matt, Matt, let me unmute you. Uh, go ahead, Matt, if you can unmute yourself. There you go. Thanks, Donna. I was trying, to, I lost my raise hand feature. Um, and I apologize, that was such a nice ending, Kathy. Uh, <laughs> But, I, but I, I had a comment that I wanted to make and I wanted to make it in the public forum. So I'm just gonna take a quick moment. And, sure. and um, so um, my name is Matt Holloway. I live uh, on Maplewood Drive. I'm the parent of a two-year-old uh, with another one due in September. Um, I serve as a resident member of the finance committee, which I disclose in the interest of transparency. Uh, my vote is non-binding on that committee. Uh, and, um, and that committee is not making this decision. So <laughs> I'm just putting some of those things out there because that question has come up. Um, I'm also on the Amherst Cultural Council, uh, which also has no role in this, in this decision. Um, but I, I'm coming tonight as a parent and a taxpayer 
Um, and I just want to share, I mean, my wife and I are very invested in this process. Um, our children will be some of the first students in the new school. Um, we moved to Amherst specifically for the schools and specifically to be close to Wildwood and the regional middle and high schools. Um, and when we were making that decision, we were under the impression that Wildwood was uh, almost certainly the choice for the new school building just based on uh, the previous ESBC decision, com comments we had heard just talking to neighbors and others who were in the know about conditions at Fort River. Um, and we were just kind of, you know, so suffice to say, very personally invested in the Wildwood site. Um, and in addition, uh, I will also say I'm, I am a public school administrator. Uh, I work for the State Department of Education. I have visited hundreds of schools um, and have seen that campus model um, of a school district uh, be pretty powerful, um, both for community, especially for community building, but also for staff integration. Um, and I think it should be the preferred model wherever possible, wherever you're choosing among equals. Um, so, you know, we've enjoyed getting to know our community in this area. Um, most of our neighbors had sent their children to Wildwood in the middle high school. It was kind of a, it felt like a track that we were, we were stepping onto. Um, but that being said, we've also become engaged in the life of the town, obviously. Um, and we have just the utmost respect for the many, many public servants who make our town function so well. Um, and I'm especially grateful to the ESBC. I've not sat through, I've not been able to watch all the meetings, but um, really appreciate the hard work and due diligence through the process. Um, and I, I mean, I have to say that, you know, the, the narrative has shifted uh, 100, 180 degrees here. Um, and, and, you know, that's okay. And if conditions at Fort River are, are acceptable to the SBC, um, and if that is the preferable site overall, then, you know, I will trust that judgment. And I trust the, the work that uh, ESBC has done on that question. Um, so while I have a strong preference for the Wildwood site, the most important thing I can say tonight, and, and I really have to emphasize this, is that uh, my wife and I, we will support the tax override regardless of site selection. Um, Amherst needs this badly. Uh, it would be terrible if the tone and the tenor of the public debate over site selection clouded that fact in people's minds uh, when the time comes to support this project at the polls. Um, so I'm in support of a new elementary school in Amherst, regardless of the location. Uh, it's what the town needs. We cannot afford to miss out on the second opportunity to do this. Um, and no matter which site is selected, like I said, prepared to commit my full efforts to support ESBC's decision and to work to make it a reality for all the kids in Amherst. So thank you for that. And thank you for giving, giving me a couple of minutes at the end. Yeah, no, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I think ultimately it's, you know, the school's going to open in 2026. So yes, we are designing a school for some students that are barely born yet, right? If you start thinking about it. So so this is actually a whole nother generation coming through. So um, it, it's it's wonderful that you're engaged and you don't even have students at the school yet. So, so we appreciate you and everyone else that has truly um, voiced their opinion and have been active during, during this entire process. Thank you very much. And thank you for the support. I, I agree, we need this school. So, so thank, thank you everyone. Um, now, I think unless someone else wants to speak, <laughs> we, we could let people go back to their families and their yeah. evenings. Thank you very much. Sounds great. Thanks everyone.